Hi, I'm Lisa Bagshaw. Welcome to Bold Leaps, the show that interviews creative, inspiring, successful people about the risks they've taken to pursue their dreams. And today's guest is one of Canada's greatest contemporary visual artists, the brilliant Ian Wallace. Ian was born on the Shoreham coast of England before his Canadian parents moved to the interior of BC to a life of adventure and expansive landscapes. His parents then moved their five sons to north and then west Vancouver, where Ian's artistic talent and entrepreneurialism began to flourish. His nearsightedness prevented him from playing sports, so he turned to his studies, writing, and a natural talent for painting. He was soon known as the school artist, and by his early teens, he was selling portraits and landscapes to his friends and neighbors. Life after high school took on a fast pace of leaving home at 17, working odd jobs, getting married, having a son, and pursuing his passion of studying art history at UBC at night and practicing art by day. Once he was at university, the embodiment of Ian Wallace as an artist, teacher, philosopher, historian, and writer took shape. For three decades, he was a highly respected lecturer and student of art history. When he was just 22, his work was featured at the Vancouver Art Gallery. And ever since, the trajectory of his career has been groundbreaking and meteoric. His work is internationally renowned, exhibited, and studied, and has put Vancouver and its esteemed artists from the Vancouver School on the map as leaders in photo conceptualism. Ian, welcome to the show. Thank you. You are definitely a bold leaper. <laughs> I'm really fascinated by the embodiment of art that has been your life. And it's almost Shakespearean in a way because you're a teacher and a student, you're a maker and a curator, your photographs became paintings, the paintings became literature, the literature became cinematography. It's, it's absolutely masterful. And uh, not to bastardize the uh, Shakespearean motif too much, but I'm very interested in the method behind the madness of it all. And I'd like to start in your childhood with the nearsightedness and how that impacted your art. Well, um, the, um, thank you for the introduction. That's, <laughs> that's a very bold introduction. <laughs> very well deserved. But, yes, thank you. But um, yes, it was only much later, much fairly recently that it began to uh, question like, were, how did I get into this and what, what turned me on to doing what I do, which is a total life commitment, as you know. And uh, I began to th realize that, you know, it's really Im important to look at like every child. I mean, nobody's born perfectly and I was born nearsighted. And I grew up in this small town and I didn't even know what nearsightedness was. And it wasn't until I moved to North Vancouver that I discovered that I needed glasses mm. <laughs> to see a baseball coming at me, right? So, but every child, as I, as I see it, every child will find some way to um, make up for what they, they can't do to compete with other children. And um, I was always able to you know, I, I think because of my nearsightedness, things being close to me, I was I could draw and do portraits of my friends and draw and entertain them with pictures mm -hmm. of battles and and uh, cowboys and, you know, all the rest, all of the things that interested kids at that time. Um, and um, so that, you know, made me interested in that. Also, in, in my classroom, um, being close, I... I was developed an interest in reading and intellectual activities and academic activities. So I became quite good at school. Mm -hmm. So my academic ability 
uh, I went up, even though I, I came across a grade one report card <laughs> from midway school that said that my accomplishments were only average, but that's fine. <laughs> that's, Little did they know. <laughs> that'll, yes. Uh, in any case, um, I just followed through with all that. And uh, uh, I think of it as, as just kind of uh, accommodating for other short, shortfalls that I have. Other people have talents in other areas like sports and and uh, academics and business and this, that, and the other. Um, the visual arts interested me incredibly and uh, the ability to draw and entertain people. And, um, it and also, I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. it also strikes me um, the sense of sort of uh, survival and your art. I'm curious about the Vancouver Art Gallery when you were 22 years old and your work was featured at the Vancouver Art Gallery. How did you feel? Oh, it was great. Um, I, I was already, this is 1965, I was already at um, uh, going to university, UBC, and um, uh, the art gallery at that time had an open juried exhibition. In other words, anybody could submit a work to be ju to be for to be juried to be in the exhibition, and I was lucky enough to do that uh, to submit a work that was uh, accepted into the exhibition and for the next couple of years also. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was a good encouragement, and. Um, uh, I used to pay attention to the uh, what was going on at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Even when I was in high school, I used to go to the gallery mm. and used to go to the, used to have these events called Art in Action, where artists in the city would go and actually make art in the gallery on mm -hmm. an evening, and you could go, the public could go and watch artists at work, you know. And I remember being particularly interested in an artist, Reg Holmes, Reginald Holmes, who's an artist that nobody talks about anymore, but he was a very good artist, and I was really quite excited by what he was doing. He was doing these abstract paintings, and and I didn't really know what an abstract painting was. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, I learned, of mm -hmm. course, in seeing some of Gordon Smith's work at the New Design Gallery, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, you know, I, I figured things out quite early um, as to what I could do to express what I wanted to express. and do what I wanted to do and uh, it's extraordinary yeah. I can't imagine how you felt looking at one of your pieces of work on the wall of the Vancouver Art Gallery for the first time. Oh I was very proud yeah you know and uh, and to know that a professional um, curator had selected my work to be in this exhibition it was like it was a, a first go and um, but I was already beginning to understand what the larger idea of art isn't just about being able to draw and paint and do pictures, right? It's a much larger project. And when I started going to university, when I left high school and took night school courses at university, and then, and then, uh, and I had a job driving a delivery truck, uh, paid the rent, et cetera, and uh, went to university and, and got into art history which was a real eye-opener for me because art history is a fantastic field because mm -hmm. it covers all cultures and all areas and all parts of the globe for the whole history of creative production of visual art, you know, which is... Uh, I started off being very interested in poet. I'm, I'm still interested in poetry. And so I started thinking, well, I could be an English teacher. And, you know, so I was taking classes in English literature. Mm -hmm. But I realized that art history and, and the teaching about art, and that was a much broader field yes. that could cover a lot of things that I was interested in. Yes, this is exactly what I'm talking yeah. about, this embodiment. Yeah. Well, we have to take a break right now. Sure. But when we come back, I am going to ask Ian about this wild ride and <clears throat> meteoric rise that his artistic life took him on. Welcome back to Bold Leaps. I am here with the world-renowned artist, visual artist, Ian Wallace. Thank you for being here again. Um, I'm going to read this because I want to get it right, uh, because I read this. After showing at the Vancouver Art Gallery in the mid-60s, when you're in your early 20s, you realized art would be a lifelong enterprise. 
What did you mean by the word enterprise? Um, well, I was driving a delivery truck <laughs> for a number of years just to pay the rent and mm -hmm. such. And, um, um, but I was lucky enough, actually, um, um, B.C. Benning, who was the head of the fine arts department at the University of British Columbia, George Rosenberg, and I had a lot of support from faculty at UBC, uh, and they hired me. I didn't even apply for the job, and they hired me to teach art history, mm -hmm. modern art history, in 1967. So, um, so that was, when I say enterprise, I mean, you think of it as a business model, in mm -hmm. effect, right? So I was able to pay the rent, and that was a a that get me that allowed me to perform my favorite performance, which is talking about the art that I love, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I met some amazing students uh, that were in my classes, and they were incredible. And um, uh, I learned more from my best students than I ever taught them, I'm sure. <sighs> um, but um, um, yeah. So, um, but I didn't, in terms of enterprise and business, I didn't, the first work I ever sold was from, in 1967, for $300, mm. uh, uh, abstract painting called Remote, mm. that's in the Belkin collection right now. Um, and, um, uh, but that paid for like six months of rent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in my apartment in Kitsilano, in my studio downtown, and that, you know, so that was really welcome. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, um, I want to ask you another, sure. another, because uh, of this, I want to try, if I can, to kind of gallop through a couple of decades here. There's so much to say, oh, but I don't know. Well, we could go on and on. I know and on. we could. So <laughs> I'm going to read this one, too. So in the late 60s, yeah. when you were still in your 20s, you were known as a pioneer of photo conceptualism. Right. In fact, to many, you were known as the godfather of <laughs> photo conceptualism, and you were part of of a worldwide cultural transformation. Were you conscious of the magnitude of what you were involved in and a part of? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had a pretty global understanding of what was happening in contemporary art uh, then and now. I mean, well now it's even more difficult because it's much more varied now. Um, but then it's, um, the, the uh, art world, the contemporary art world is mostly dominated by, by abstract painting and such, which I was still very, very interested in, felt was very important. But also the use of photography uh, started to become important. And, and uh, I didn't invent photoconceptualism. I was just responding to all the possibilities that came up with the use of photography in contemporary art to because in photographs, you can create representations that talk about modern life, talk about personal uh, issues and, and all kinds of imagery and iconography that, that um, enlivens a work of art. Uh, and so it, it was very exciting. And there were students in my, you know, for instance, um, Chris Dikia, Christos Dikiakos, still a, a very important artist in Vancouver, um, uh, did a, an exhibition called The Photo Show which gathered together all these uh, wide range of artists that were dealing with uh, photography in their work, including myself and mm -hmm. people like Jeff Wall, Rodney Graham, and, and others, including other artists like Ed Rouché and, and such, that Dan Graham, that were artists that were not from Vancouver, but from working outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just thought that, well, this is a really good direction to go in. And so I developed it in my own particular way, combining it with abstract painting, which I was still very interested in, and felt that it was really important as a, as a support or ground for this photographic work. Did you ever feel that any sort of, I mean, these are big names, you know, that, yeah. that you were the godfather of oh. this movement. Did you ever feel sort of an, an imposter syndrome or... Is this really happening to me? No, no, it was just uh, like just trying to get the best work out there. And I wasn't concerned with uh, uh, the Godfather image only came later in, you know, <laughs> and it was a bit exaggerated, really. I wasn't the only one. There were other artists involved in that story. And uh, I wrote a, uh, I think, a pretty comprehensive and 
and effective essay that was published in, um, in Montreal in, jeez, uh, I forget the year, 73 or 72, something like that, called Photos Photoconceptualism in Vancouver, mm. in which I identified all the artists that I thought were working with photography in a way that I thought was very interesting. And that got published, and, and so that brought the word photoconceptualism into it, because I was interested in the intellectual issues in uh, conceptual art that was coming up at the time, and the use, the relationship to photography, which took the more intellectual issues of conceptual art and put them back into the social environment to, you know, represent um, what's going on in our lives and in the city as a whole, in our economy and the landscape, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that's was my the basic trajectory of my intellectual interests that were promoted in that essay called Photoconceptualism in Vancouver. And that gave me the, suddenly everybody was identifying me as the inventor of photoconceptualism, but I didn't invent it. Mm -hmm. I only was kind of expressing my interest in what was going on with other artists as well, which I continued to do. Well, that's been a big part of your life, actually, yeah. is, again, you know, you're, you're, you're a teacher, but then there's the students, and the students are teaching the teacher, yeah. and you've created this incredible community yeah. of people, and you, you, never, you never take the glory, and you always no. talk about the community yeah. aspect. Yeah. Well, that's important, you know. Uh, I mean, I support anything that I... I, you know, th can identify with and think that it's a really good direction to go in. Um, and, and that includes a wide range of, um, of aspirations of a wide range of artists, too. Mm -hmm. um, but um, no, I, I, I'm uh, the great thing about working in Vancouver and living in Vancouver is that there's just such a vibrant, creative situation here mm -hmm. from a wide variety of artists um, over a long period of time. And we have enough um, kind of venues for the work to be exhibited um, and I've had a part in, in uh, supporting a lot of these. In my old age now, I, you know, I, can't, I don't necessarily have all the energy and the resources to support everything going on, but I, I try to as much as possible. I know that you do, and um, you're, you're very humble. We have to take another break. Okay. But when we come back, I am going to ask Ian how life is now and what advice he has for those of us who are too afraid to pursue our dreams when we come back. <laughs> Welcome back to Bold Leaps. I am here with the incredible Ian Wallace. Ian, tell me about you jerks. Oh, <laughs> you jerks, yes. Um, that was just um, a, a fun project uh, during the late 70s, early 80s, um, which was, uh, I mean, I, I've been playing guitar just, just for the fun of it for years and always interested in jazz and music. Um, but, um, you know, in, in the 70s, the, the whole new wave and punk music thing started to happen. And I just, we just started in effect what was what you would call an art band, you know, just a non professional band, you know, group of various artists that were felt like playing music and were good at it, including Jeff Wall and Rodney Graham. Yeah, two the same really group of people. Good friends, yeah. yes, indeed. And Colin Griffith, who I still play with and jam with in my studio. Um, we just decided to, you know, play some music and, and with uh, Frank Ramirez and David Wisdom, who used to had a radio program on CBC. Um, we just wrote songs and played music and did a number of gigs over a couple of years and actually did a record with Polygram and such. But Polygram, you know, decided we were really popular and liked us and wanted to offer us a big contract to <laughs> tour and do records and everything. We said, no, 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 we're just, we're just amateurs. We're not professionals. So we kind of begged out of it and turned down a rather attractive situation, I think. Well, you can't but, do everything. What do you think the biggest lesson was that you learned? Determination, mm -hmm. hard work, um, a larger picture, I think uh, of like you got to have the the not think of just your own personal career or your own 
personal interest, but how it adds up to a larger kind of uh, project mm. that can mean something to other people in other times. Uh, you, you, you referred to modesty. <laughs> and uh, yes, you know, because the art world is not just one or two geniuses. It's the all, a whole lot of people of varying talents and interests all working together. Uh, and, uh, and the audience, you know, it's the people, it's the collectors, it's the audience, uh, people, other people and young people and old people that are interested in seeing what you do. And, and their presence alone, just to look at the work, is a contribution, you know, is important as far as I, and even an interview like this. <laughs> well, I really, um, I really appreciate that perspective. Yeah. What advice do you have for people who are too afraid to pursue their dreams? Oh, you can never be too afraid to pursue your dreams. If you have dreams, then take it to the limit. <laughs> well, what if you're just afraid and you just, you're afraid of failure? Um, well, I mean, we, you have to face that. Mm -hmm. I mean, even as an artist, not everybody likes what I do. Uh, some people might probably think I'm a phony and that's like ego crushing. <laughs> you can't be afraid of that. You have to say, I'm sorry, I'm just doing what I sincerely believe is important to do and that I can do and I hope you enjoy it and I'll continue to do that whether you like it or not. <laughs> I so you have to have that kind of fortitude. <laughs> And it's hard work, yeah. it's, and, and you have to know what you're doing and do it well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, I mean, even to be an amateur, um, amateur musician even, and I'm mm -hmm. not a musician, you have to do things properly and mm -hmm. do them right and learn how to do them. And that's already a great and inspiring situation for a lot of people, mm -hmm. learning new talents. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Well, thank you so much for being a guest yeah. on Bold Leaps. And yeah. thank you for everything that you've done, not only by putting your um, thought-provoking work out there, but um, educating so many people, educating the students, the, the young students, the older students, all of us. You've made such a, a huge contribution to the world. So thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'm still learning myself. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm still growing. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, keep on going. <laughs> well, that's it for another episode of Bold Leaps. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to YouTube for more inspiring episodes. Special thanks to Fresh Street Market. And remember, every step you take is a step toward your dreams.